All right, chapter nine, places to be. Scoob's apprehension continues through brunch, as Gma calls it, especially since she makes him bring his backpack inside the restaurant with her treasure box inside and glances at it every few minutes like it's going to suddenly sprout legs, hop up, and scurry away. It's weird. However, on the way out, when g -Ma pulls her phone out of her pocketbook to snap a pic of Scoob after making him plop down in one of the wooden rocking chairs on the Cracker Barrel front porch, she discovers it's turned off. How and when it got that way, Scoob doesn't know. He doesn't think he shut it off when he was handling it last night, but he guesses it's possible. Anyway, she turns it on and says, oh... Looky there, your daddy called. Before lifting it to her ear to listen to the voicemails, Scoob's heart unclenches. So maybe she didn't lie. He takes a huge breath of Mississippi air into his lungs and blows it out. Though he still can't help but watch her closely. Her expression stays neutral, and after all, a minute or so, she rolls her eyes and waves her hand in the air like she's swatting away a mosquito and pulls the phone away from her ear. What'd you say? Scoob can't help but ask. What did he say? Sorry, Scoob can't help but ask. You don't even want to know. Sit on down so I can get my photo of you. And there's a picture. Scoob does as she says, and Gmaz hold, holds the phone up, grins. My most favorite is grandson, she says. I'm your only grandson, Gma. Oh, hush, and bring your hiney, she says with a chuckle before heading back to the Winnebago. And then, just as she said, they head to the grocery store. On the way back to the highway, though, things take another turn for the strange and unusual. As they're passing a big shopping center, Gma says, oh, a jewelry store, and decides to turn off. Uh, do we need some jewelry? Scoob asks, humor me, will ya? Not like he has any choice in the matter. She's an adult. The minute they step inside, Gma clasps her hands beneath her chin and sighs. You'd think she'd stumble into heaven. As she wanders around, gazing into the glass cases full of stuff so sparkly, some of it hurts Scoob's eyes to look at. He decides to try and make the most of her distraction. He <coughs> sidles up beside her. So, what did my dad say, g -ma? He asks, all nonchalant-like. Oh, you know, she replies, trying to brush it off. But Scoob's not letting it slide this time. He knows how many times dad called and how many messages he left. And, yeah, the guy can be wound tighter than a spoon, spool of thread. But that was a lot, even for him. He want anything in particular? Other than killing all the joy? Nope, she starts whistling, which sets Scoob's internal alarms off again. He knows from years of playing Texas Hold'em with Gma that whistling is her bluffing tell. You gonna call him back? Nah, maybe later, she says, wandering over to a case at eye level that has a necklace in it with a jewel the size of a ping pong ball. For now, why don't you tell me more about the latest issue between you two? What do you mean? Except Scoop has a feeling he knows where this is going. I want to hear about the computer cheating, she says. And just like that, she's flipped it on him again. Scoop sucks his teeth. Come on, Gma, he says, glancing around. The store is empty, but the man behind the central counter with a ring of keys has been watching him since he walked in. He kind of wants to leave. You don't want to hear that right now, do you? Unless you'd rather talk about your young lady friend, Shanice. No! Scoob scratches the back of his neck, his nervous tail. g -ma laughs outright. It's just that there are more interesting things we could discuss, you know? Like what you were like when you were my age, or why we're in a jewelry store. When she doesn't respond immediately, Scoob looks at her. Her eyes are sad. Oh, I was a downright menace at your age, Scooby-Doo. You were? 
Mm-hmm. I'm not proud of it, but my favorite pastimes at 11 were pocket pickpocketing and petty theft. Scoops, sure, he looks just like she told him. She knows Santa's real because they kick it at the North Pole together on the weekends. He knows she mentioned some poor decisions, but really? Whoa. This is what I meant earlier. There's a whole heap you don't know about your GMOD, kiddo. Scoob doesn't respond. What you should know is that I'm concerned. Knowing what I was like at your age, I'm real curious about the whys of the trouble you've been in. She waves the key ring man over and points out a ring. It's got red stones running all the way around. She slips it onto a finger and holds her hand up to admire it. You know, my name is Ruby, she says to the guy. Todd. His name tag says. It makes him smile. It's perfect for you, ma'am, he says. Now Scoob's smiling, too. It really does look pretty good on her. So, tell me all about this. Academic defraudment scandal is what they called it, right? She says, jolting Scoob back to the moment. He rolls his eyes. Mr. Atzbani, the computer science teacher, had been so extra about the whole situation. There hadn't been anything scandalous about it. It was all just a big mistake, he says. All righty, do tell. Scoop sighs. Everything happened in computer science. Mm-hmm. And, like, not to brag, but I can do 90% of the work in there with my eyes closed and hand tied behind my back. Gma laughs, but Scoob is serious. He knows his way around most computers since pre-K. He always got 100% on the quizzes. At Bonnie made them take at the beginning of the class every day. Always. Except for the one time two weeks before spring break when Scoob was going too fast and clicked B instead of C on question 8. He remembers smacking his forehead because he blurted, Ow! in a loud whisper, and a bunch of his classmates turned to look at him. He was embarrassed about that, but when he finished the quiz and that 90% glared tauntingly at him from the score report page. I couldn't handle it, Gma, he says. All I could hear in my head was Dad's rambling on about careless mistakes and how they would ruin my future. He shakes his head. I considered going to my teacher. Was it really that big of a deal, though, kiddo? You said you'd gotten all 100s prior. What's 190? Well, but how can he explain? The way Dad puts it, there will always be people who don't want to see boys like Scoob do well. Dad's never said it explicitly, but Scoob knows what he means. Black boys. So it's vital that Scoob never give anyone a reason to doubt his capabilities. Which is something Scoob understands beneath his skin and down in his bones somewhere, but doesn't know how to put it into words. I mean, Dad says, oh, fiddlesticks on that, she interrupts, which so surprises Scoob, he jumps. That old goat, go on with your story. Uh, okay. Sorry, she says. He's just always been so hard on himself, your dad has, and it grinds my gears that he's transferring it to you. She waves to Todd again, points out a pair of earrings Scoob thinks are diamonds, though they have a pinkish tint. Ah, yes, the fancy and tense pinks. Todd crows as he hands them to her. Excellent choice. He lays a mirror on the counter. So what happened next with your teacher? She asks Scoob as she sticks the skinny posts into her wrinkly earlobes. Scoob sighs, trying to recenter himself in the story. It's not that I thought the teacher would change my grade or anything. I just wanted him to know I knew the right answer. But when I looked up, he was like laser eyeing me like I had farted in class or something. Gma lets out a barking. Ha! <laughs> Scoob smiles and continues. Dad would say I'm making excuses, but I really don't think Mr. Atzbani likes me very much. Every time I get a bad grade or raise my hand to answer one of his questions, he frowns. Anyway, deep down, I knew I'd have to cut my losses and take the L. The L? For loss? Ah, I see. Go on. 
But it was bugging me so bad that I knew the right answer, but accidentally got it wrong. So what happened next? She asks. Well, there were still eight minutes left on the quiz clock, so I decided to use the extra time to take a peek at the coding. He says, the quizzes are always multiple choice, and the way the software was set up, choosing an answer on a question takes you straight to the next question. So, I was trying to see if there was a way to change an answer from the inside. Mm hmm Gma points to the necklace with a ruby pendant and a bracelet covered in diamonds shaped like diamonds. Last two, I promise, she tells Todd with her crinkly smile as she unlocks another case. Whatever you need, ma'am, and take your time. I'm here all day. Wink. As soon as he walks away, Scoob goes on. I swear, I wasn't going to change it, Chima. I just wanted to see if it was possible. Okay, and? Well, once I skimmed the block of code, I saw where I could change the score my teacher would see on my computer screen when he walked around the room to jot down everybody's grades. So I gave it a try. I knew from seeing the rest that all I'd have to do to get my actual score to reappear was click the refresh button. Gma steps up to the big mirror and examines her newly bedazzled self. You're speaking geek now, but continue. She turns this way and that. Scoop size. What I'm saying is there was a spot on the back end where I could change 90 to 100. And when I did and then returned the score report screen, it read 100%. William! Gma puts one little fist on her hip, all indignant like. I didn't leave it that way, Gma, though he definitely wanted to. Like I said, when I refreshed the page, my real score came back. Which is where the trouble began. For one, when Ot's Bonnie came around to record the scores and got to Scoob's, he made some snide remark about how Scoob's boastful lack of attention during class was finally making its mark. That made Scoob angry and made Dad's words more uh, words about people not wanting Scoob to do well that much more real. Scoob was so mad, in fact, that when for two. Cody Williams, the soccer superstar who sat to Scoop's left and constantly stretched so he could get a peek at Scoop's screen during class, approached Scoop and said he'd seen what Scoop had done with the scores and wanted to learn how to do it. Well, Scoop agreed. And Cody was careful. He changed his scores gradually over the next few days and told Aunt Bonnie he'd been studying harder. Did Scoop feel a pang of guilt every time he heard Cody clicking around to change his score? Yeah, he did, but Scoop ignored it. He wasn't the one cheating, after all. Except, then things got complicated, because Cody taught Deja, and Deja taught Holly, and Holly taught Bryce, and on and on. Within a couple weeks, the class quiz average had risen to 97%, and Otz Bonnie got suspicious. I'll never forget the day everything came crashing down, Scoob says, as they approach the center counter, and Gma began begins to remove all the jewelry she's wearing. I could see it coming. Otsbani started his score marking stroll like usual. But when he got to Bryce's computer, he stopped. When his beady eyes got all squinty and he turned to look back at all at the computers like he checked, I knew it was over. Well, that sure sounds bleak. Gma takes the earrings off one by one and sets them down. It was dead silent. Scoob continues. Otsbani reached out and pushed a key on Bryce's keyboard and went, mm-hmm, and then made us all get up and go stand at the back of the room. I knew he was pressing F5 at each computer before writing scores down. F5? Gma asked. Yeah, refresh. After Otsbani wrote the real scores down, he told everyone to stay put, then left the room. Not a single person breathed the word in his absence. He returned four minutes later with the principal in tow. What's nuts is that despite the fact that my score was one of four that didn't change, Bryce ratted me out as the mastermind. Yowza, from Gma. Yeah, Otz Bonnie wanted me expelled with utmost sincerity. But Dad and Principal Armand settled on a five-day suspension. Bye-bye, spring break. Bye-bye, freedom, he sighs. Todd approaches again. 
So, what do you think, young lady? He says to Jima. Anything tickle your fancy? Oh, I can't afford any of this, she says, unlatching the necklace and laying it down all nice, then the bracelet. Though I appreciate you letting an old gal dream big for a bit. When you get to be my age, you never know when you'll just... She makes a choking sound and drags an index finger across her neck. Todd's eyes go wide. Scoob's do too. Uh, Jima? All righty then, Todd says, sweeping the jewelry from the counter and uh, clearly as uncomfortable with Jima's declaration as Scoob is. You all enjoy your Sunday, and he jets off. When they get to the door and Jima goes to push it open, Scoob notices a flash of red on her hand. Jima, wait, he says. You forgot to take the ring off. That gets Todd's attention. Oddly enough, Jima looks more caught than shocked. Her face is as red as a raspberry. Oh my, she says. Over says. Honestly, she looks the same way Bryce did. The one time a teacher saw him shove Drake in a school hallway. He tried to play it off and said he'd trip. What the heck is going on? Well, guess that's the end of fan fantasy jewelry shopping for this old bird. I'm clearly losing my marbles. Todd slowly outstretches his hand as Jima crosses the store, and Scoob can see he ain't exactly buying her story. But he does let them leave. Well, that was a close one, Jima says as they head back to the RV, which is when Scoob notices the license plate, which is white again, but says Tennessee. Let's get a move on, Jima says, as if the previous 15 minutes never happened. We got places to be.